If you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 28, a familiar passage to many of us, because we recognize this passage as the Great Commission. We recognize this passage as the last words that Christ really gives to his his followers. Now, in this passage, uh, Matthew gives it to us in a little different way. We move in Matthew. If you were to look at all of Matthew chapter 28, you would recognize that Matthew starts by, at the end of that chapter, he begins talking about the resurrection, and he begins talking about what's going on inside that, and then he immediately goes to Jesus, his last words, right before the ascension, probably. If we were to pick that up in first of Acts, we would see a little more detail of that. Matthew bypasses all that. He just goes from that place of being able to talk about who Christ is and his resurrection and uh, the strength of who he is, and then he says, and these are the last words. This is what we call the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission because uh, it really is what God has put in our lives to be able to take forward into those around us. And I use this passage today because it really is, I believe, the mission of the church. I believe it's what the church is all about, and I more so believe that's my mission. It's who I am. What drives me as a person in ministry is this passage. What drives me is what he tells us in this passage about who he is, a lot less than who we are. Because if we can get a grasp of who he is versus who we are, it makes all the difference to how we tell other people about who he is. Because when we recognize who he is and his strength and his power and his authority, it allows us then to have the strength and power and authority that we need when we talk to other people around us. And so the focus is not on us, it's not on what we have to say, it's what on the Word of God has to say about who Christ is, and he himself tells us that when he is high and lifted up, he draws people to himself, and that's what we must be about. But this verse drives me, this verse drives the church, it is the mission that we're called to. So if you have it in front of you, he says clearly, we're just going to look at the last three verses of this chapter, Jesus came to them, this being his apostles, those that were gathered around him. Uh, others and just his disciples, but he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, great word right there that we won't preach on today, but inside that, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he gives us the Trinity. He gives us the understanding of the Godhead, of who he is. That's a great doctrinal piece that we need to hear. Just those verses in that help us to realize who God is. In verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Now we're going to look at this passage and try to see really three phrases that come out of this passage that drive us. The first phrase that we looked at is that whole idea is all authority has been given to me. That's what Jesus said, all authority. Now we do that because the first thing we want to do is declare the Father's glory. And everything that Jesus was about, he was about declaring the glory of the Father. And that should drive us, whether we're at school, whether we're at work, whether we're at home, wherever we are, what drives us is that we're declaring the Father's glory. Nothing about us, nothing about what our abilities are, our capabilities are, but it's about the glory of the Father. Jesus himself does that. Jesus himself, and all that he does is glorifying the Father. The Spirit of God in the New Testament has one purpose, and that is to glorify the Son, which in turn glorifies the Father. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture, and he tells us here that all authority has been given to me. It's a great word for us. The word authority has several different meanings as we would look at the word. The first thing that it has is understanding God's power. Now, if you have a King James Version or a New King James in your translation of your text, it may even say that, that all power has been given to God. Now, inside that, what he's talking about is the glory of God. It's talking about authority in a different level. It's not talking about a power that, uh, and oftentimes in the New Testament, the word power is used that we get our word dynamite from. is as if something is blowing up. Well, he doesn't use that word here. He uses the word authority. And in that authority, there is power. There's a power in our authority. There's a power that you have in authority as a parent. There's a power that you have an authority if you're a a teacher, a professor, a school teacher. You have have authority in in that power. So it, it really is based in positional power, right? There's position that you have that allows you to have authority. And that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the authority that he has because he is positioned as the son of God 
all creation is now under him. He gives us a little better glimpse of that in John chapter 17. He tells us in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, after saying these things, Jesus looked to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son. So in that, he asked the Lord, the, the, Jesus was asking the Father to glorify him for, some, for one reason, for you have given him authority over everything. That's that same word. You have given him authority, position over all things. Now that's important for us as a people, that's important for me as a person in Christ, because my authority is not my own, but I do find my position before the Father based on the fact of who Christ is in me. It's not a position that I get by doing good works. It's not a position I get by uh, taking care of everything that I can. It's a position that I find because of the righteousness of God in Christ alone. So in Christ, I find my position. Christ says the authority that he has is the power that he has, and that's the strength that he has. And so the authority becomes a very important piece as we declare the Father's glory. The second thing that comes out of the understanding of the glory of God and who he is and this power that he gives us is God's justice. God's justice. In this word authority is also the word, it's a legal idea of being just. It's as if you go into the courtroom and there must be justice about everything. That's why I list this verse from Romans chapter 3 or chapter 6 verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He gives us that idea of the wages of sin. The, the, the legal purpose of our, our being who we are is the authority of who Christ is. Christ Christ in his position who died on the cross has given us new life and the legal justice that he has, there will be some people who will say, for example, that God loves everyone and God does love everyone. And there will be some who will take that one step further and they'll say God loves everyone, so therefore everyone is going to be saved. And everyone is going to spend time in heaven. And everyone is, when, when the end of life comes... Because God is so good, every person is going to go to heaven. Now, I don't believe the Bible teaches that at all. That's a core value for me. I believe the Bible teaches that this authority is also justice. It's also when we sin, there is a wage to our sin. The wages of sin is death, says the Bible, but the gift of God that is done through us through Christ, Christ has paid the penalty. He has been the one who has paid for our sin. But there are those who will not accept that. There are those who will not trust in Christ for salvation. And when they do, my belief is... That when they die, they will not spend eternity with God, but they will actually spend eternity in hell. And it becomes the position of the church. It becomes the position of the leaders. It becomes the position of the people. All of us ministering together for the purpose of glorifying Christ, for the purpose of lifting him up. Because we know that when someone dies, leaves this world without Christ, they spend eternity in hell. I believe that. 100%. And I've got to tell you, when I've been watching over the last couple of days, the fires in California, that's one of the first things that comes to my mind when it tells me they found more people who have died in a car or who tried to get out of the fire. It's tragic. It's tragic that they're dying. But, but my first question in my heart and mind is, did they know Christ? Did, did, they know, did they know Christ as Savior, as Lord? Is, was there someone who spoke into their lives? Was there someone who was teaching them about who Christ is and had, had confronted them with the gospel? That's not only true there, but that's true all around us. In southern Indiana, there are thousands of people, thousands of college students, thousands of single adults, thousands of married adults, thousands of, of, in our older generation, our greatest generation, who have never accepted Christ. And what we look at then is inside that God has a God of justice. So he brings us advice in this word of authority that he has all authority and that authority is his power, which is his strength. That authority is the justice that he has to be able to make those decisions. But inside that is the authority of salvation. And that's what we get most of all. The understanding that he has given to us salvation. He tells us that in Romans chapter 10, when he begins to tell us, as Paul writes and tells us, I'm going to read that from my text because it says just, just a great word about how it flows. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, 
If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with a heart resulting in righteousness. Resulting in righteousness. And one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. And so the authority, the glorifying the Father has to do with the fact that we are people who are focused on salvation, are focused on the authority of Christ and who he is to be all strength for us. He gives us all strength. He he is the one who is just, but he's the one who gives salvation because he is the one who has paid the penalty for our sin. That's what drives me. That's where my heart is. That's what I desire for the heart of the church to be so that when you see your neighbors and you see people that you go to the store with or that you go to school with, that what, what you think about them is not good or bad and there are those things that come out of that, but what we think about them is where they're going to spend eternity. How are they going to live their life in order that when they pass from this world to the next, they're going to be in heaven celebrating the joys of heaven. Now, I'll go right on to be able to say the second point today is deliver the gospel. And that's what he gets to. That's what he tells us as we understand his authority. What he allows us to do is to be able to go and make disciples. What he tells us in this passage. That's what he says to them. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, he tells us that. He doesn't tell us that we have to just go out for special occasions. That's not what that word is, though there are times we do that. What he really is talking about in passage to these disciples and to us, that as we are going through life, as we go places together, as we go places, as we are just going through the natural walking of life, what comes out of our life should be the kind of character, the kind of people, the kind of examples so that those who see us might glorify the Father. They might recognize who Jesus is in our lives. That becomes a very difficult thing for us. I've just written a few things in your notes that brings about the importance of membership to the body. I believe that the body is, is what Christ died for. I believe the church is the power of God. Now, I know there's the, the church, when we sense the, the church as the big C, you know, the, the church that's around the world. We have believers who are, who are in all parts of the world and they're, they're part of the church of, of the family of God, right? But I believe that the, the church, us, right here, God has a design for us as a body, for us as a people, that he brings you here for purpose. He brings you here for a reason. You're not a member of Graceland just because you, you decided to or you thought it would be a great thing to be. Now, in our minds, we might think that. We like the place. We want to be a member here. But if God is at work in our lives, God is forming the body together. God is bringing us together for the purpose about the body going and making an impact with our neighbors, going and making an impact in our communities right where we are. The importance of membership is vital to us as a church. The importance of maturity, the idea that we are growing in Christ, and that's what he gets to this idea of disciple. A discipleship sometimes becomes a, a word that we think, man, there's so much to that, it's so hard to do, how do we grow as disciples? But the word discipleship is simply the idea of growing. It's maturing. It's being able to say that now I've been a Christian 10 years, I think about things differently than when I were a Christian five years. And when I'm a Christian for 50 years, I should be a a whole lot more mature in my walk than when I was a Christian for 10 years. And that's what discipleship is. It's just growing in Christ's likeness. It's just, it's just walking with him. It's just being able to go where he's taking us and being able to say, I'm growing in my life as a follower of Christ. As a church, we must push that direction. The third thing, the importance of the mandate. The mandate is that whole idea when Jesus says you are going. So we take that as a mandate. That is what we must do. We do not have the luxury of saying, well, we're not going to do that, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do something else, because the mandate of the church, the mandate of my life, is to go and make disciples. And when I think about this passage, and he says, go into all the nations and make disciples, sometimes we think, well, that's just about going overseas, or that's just about going somewhere else, because the nations are out there. That's not what he's talking about. 
Matter of fact, he clarifies that in Acts 1.8, where he says, no, it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It's your neighbors across the street. It's those who are across the river, those who are in another state from us, and those who are in, it's, it's everyone around us. Because we're not just going there, we're going there, wherever we go. It's about the mandate of going so that my life is showing who Christ is and how I walk with Christ. The example that I give inside that. And the last thing, the importance of mission. And what I mean by that, I don't mean the word missions, the importance of missions, that's important to the church, but the important for each of us to be on mission. The important fact that each of us has been called, we've been given a spiritual gift, there's a design that God has shaped us in, and God has had a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. You need to know what that is. You need to discover what that purpose is. But inside that purpose is just going to our everyday life. It's, it's where you live. It's where you work. It's the people that you hang out with at school. It's, it's those around us. God has us in a purpose, and that's the mission. There's no other way where man must be saved other than Christ. And when we know Christ as our Savior and the Lord, that's our mission. It, we're on mission every day, glorifying the Father, declaring his glory through Christ and what he has done but at the same time, delivering the gospel as we go. And he ends this passage as we discover the grace, just this one phrase, the grace of God, the goodness of God. I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you always to the end of the age. That's God's grace in our lives. Sometimes we forget that he is with us. Sometimes we miss the fact that where we go and what we do and how we live through life, that God's strength out of his authority, God's power that we get from him, God's salvation, we, we know all those things, but to apply those to our lives, it's very difficult. Today is Veterans Day, and I'd want to personally say thank you so much for serving uh, our country. Would you just, just, just thank our friends who are here? Man. Thank you so much. The importance of your role and how you served. My father served in World War II. Elizabeth's dad served in World War II. Elizabeth's brother is a retired colonel from the Air Force. My brother served in Vietnam. We have a son, our youngest son, Ben, right now is in the Navy serving, uh, in a, and he's deployed right now with a Marine unit. Even though he's a Navy corpsman, he's with a Marine unit and will be deployed for another several months. The church we came from was a, a church near Fort Campbell Army Post. Our best friends are military families that we have just grown up with through the years that have sons and daughters uh, serving in the military. We understand the importance of that. And we understand that in these days, these are, these are difficult days for us in so many ways. There are difficult things that are going on around us. But now remember, none of that takes God by surprise. None of that is new for him. He understands and he knows. And if we as believers can for a moment grasp this understanding that he is with us always, he is never going to leave you or me. He is never going to leave us. He is with us. Now, there's a lady who wrote a song in 1943. Her name was Ruth Jones. Ruth was a mother of five. It was a horrible time. The, the World War II was going on. They, they listed the casualties in the newspaper uh, during World War II. And she, she read those one time, and she began to look over those. And she wrote this song. And you may recognize this song. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be sure, be sure, your anchor is in the solid rock. Maybe you remember that hymn. That's one that we've sang through the ages because it helps us to remember. She went on to write that Jesus is the rock. Be sure that that's where our anchor is. And I would conclude with that today. That as a church, we can do a lot of things. As a church, we can be busy about activities we can be busy about doing stuff. And those are good things. Those are helpful things. But as a church and as individuals, we've got to know that our anchor is in Christ and in Christ alone. And when we go out to our community to share our lives, we share about the church, but really we share about Christ because he's the one that changes us. 
He's the one that transforms us. Now, maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. Oh, you've heard the gospel today. Jesus says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in the heart, in your heart, you can be saved today. Believe in Christ, raised from the dead, that you might know him. And we would pray that today, before you would ever leave here, you would say, yes, I want to trust Christ. Maybe you're here today and you say, man, there are so many things going on in my life. There's so many things that are happening around us that you need prayer for, that you need help with. Come back to the end of this message. Come back to the end of this verse. And just remember that God loves you so much that he is always with you. He is never going to leave you or forsake you. He even says to us, when your burden is heavy, bring it to me, rest on me. Because see, he is the one that we glorify. He is the one that's called us to action. He is the one who is transforming lives. And that makes the difference. And that's who we are. It's who I am as a person. That's who a church would be called out to be, that we seek to share with our community these verses, that Christ is the only way for a person to have salvation. And in Christ, in Christ alone, that would be our proclamation to our community of Southern Indiana, to our state of Indiana, to our nation, to around the world. When we go forward, we're proclaiming Christ and Christ alone.